of this time is to just provide a top line overview of the different um, programs that are happening, any updates and changes since we spoke last time. I do know that we are also joined by folks on Facebook. Um, for legislators, of course, you can um, unmute yourself and ask questions or put questions in the chat box. Um, we, I'm joined here by my colleague. Hi, I'm Kim Smith. I'm the Deputy Commissioner. And we're hoping to provide um, some top line information about some of the things that we've either heard concerns about over the past week or changes that are happening to the, uh, the program, as well as to give you some information about upcoming, um, upcoming uh, events. Um, events is probably not the right word, but upcoming um, uh, opportunities uh, for um, people who are participating in the program. And I think we have a, uh, about eight or 10 slides that we want to go through because it seems like it's easier uh, to put some of the information out that way and then we'll go um, to the questions. So as we've been talking about now for about um, you know, a number of weeks, our goal here at the department is to try to do a couple of things. One is to make sure that we get benefits, unemployment insurance benefits out as quickly as possible. But um, if you remember back in May when we were talking, we're also addressing the fact that there are some fundamental things that need redesigning and uh, improving as we move forward. And so today I'd like to at least begin to lay out some of those issues. Um, as you know, the unemployment insurance uh, program is paid for, the state unemployment insurance program, by taxes on employers. They pay on the first $12,000 uh, for their employees. And the intent of state unemployment is to help uh, workers by providing temporary wage replacement during brief periods of unemployment. <clears throat> the program was never designed to cover the, the scope of the um, kinds of people who currently now need um, unemployment assistance and the fundamental program has not evolved or adapted to the changing economy. And that's pretty much what we saw happening uh, back in March. The country was hit by a pandemic and Congress acted, um, did an assessment, a very quick one, uh, to see what was the best way to get benefits out to workers who were going to be losing their jobs. And they were looking broadly at workers. And when they um, came up with the plan in the CARES Act, the three federal programs, they were trying to do a couple of things. One was addressing benefit levels. Uh, each state has different levels of basic unemployment benefits, but um, there was an agreement uh, or an understanding on the part of most people in Congress that those benefit levels were not going to be sufficient. And that's where that additional $600 federal pandemic unemployment compensation um, piece came from. The other thing that they looked at was coverage, that today's workers did not um, fit that neat mold of W-2 employment um, working for a particular employer uh, with W-2 wages. And so that's why the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program was created to cover all of those workers who um, are what we're calling gig workers um, or self-employed workers or people who are not typically covered by unemployment insurance programs, the traditional unemployment insurance programs. And then the other thing that Congress also recognized was that the funds to fund the administration of the unemployment insurance programs, which are federal funds, um, have not kept pace with the needs and that they would need, there would need to be um, additional funds to um, provide those services. So I just wanted to kind of ground us in that, um, that backdrop before jumping into where are we at where are we at today? So one of the programs that I just mentioned, Federal Pandemic Unemployment uh, Insurance, as all of you know, 
That is the uh, program that's commonly referred to as the $600 payment. That payment um, expires. Um, and the last week that that payment was eligible for was the week ending July 25th, which means that depending on when someone files that weekly certification for the week ending July 25th, and for most people, it's, they would be filing that certification this week, this will be the last week that that $600 is included. We've all heard um, lots of news reports about um, uh, various um, concepts that Congress is considering, uh, and we do not know uh, what, if anything, that they will do. Um, some of the programs that they're talking about are some sort of flat rate. Um, it was six hundred dollars, whether it stays six hundred or goes to some other flat rate amount, is the kind of change that we could implement pretty quickly. Um, and um, so that's one option. There are also a number of other options, uh, and um, we're hearing talk about somehow individualizing whatever that wage replacement would be based on the individual earnings of a particular person. We don't have any um, additional information about that. We cannot estimate how long it would actually take to implement it without seeing what the details are of the proposal. However, the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, which is the um, association that represents all of the workforce uh, agencies across the country, um, has submitted uh, a letter to Congress basically saying that it would take um, states months, uh, if at all, um, before being able to implement uh, that, that kind of individualized program. But again, we'd have to see the details. I think the uh, challenge is that it, as people are desperately in need of these benefits, um, there may be um, you know, a gap in those kinds of services to people when they really need them, depending on um, what action Congress takes. Now, the two programs that are still available are um, the regular state unemployment assistance. So as you remember, the $600 was on top of whatever the weekly benefit was for people and the pandemic unemployment assistance program. So that was the program that was specifically targeted toward people who were self-employed, gig workers, people who weren't um, didn't have the uh, job attachment or necessary earnings to qualify for regular state unemployment assistance. That program is still um, available until the end of December. And so there is that, uh, that resource that will be um, still continuing to, um, to flow to people who are eligible for the program and filing their weekly certifications. People were receiving a basic uh, benefit there of $172 a week and then the $600 on top of it. Last week, and I'll turn it over to my colleague to explain um, steps we've taken um, to uh, increase that benefit amount for people who were, are eligible for something higher than that $172 um, benefit. We have broken the, um, the change in people's PUA benefits into a two-phased approach. So the first phase was for people who we were able to match their, their tax information to, from 2019 to an active claim. So for those folks, we've, we've gone ahead and done that. We've had so far, about 6,000 people who have seen an increase in their weekly benefits. Um, we had another roughly 6,000 so far that have stayed at the 172,000, excuse me, $172 level. And then the other 8,000 at this point will need to submit documentation. And we are continuing to do those checks. So we know there are, are more folks that we need to verify their income, and we'll be doing that in the, in the coming days. The second phase of that is to, for, again, for those people that we were not able to match, those, those 8,000 so far, 
we will be sending out instructions in the next couple of days for them to upload their documentation. And on the next screen, uh, we're just going to walk through the steps for uploading that documentation. What you're looking at here is the, the login screen. Once you log into the reemploy me system, this is what you'll see. And in the um, options for uploading your documentation, you can either find it up in the upper left corner of, of the tab that says provide PUA proof of earnings, or you can also find it in the bottom right under the click link. So if you click on either one of those, the next screen will be, it's just the basic question, are you self-employed or not? Um, we do have some folks who are not self-employed who are receiving PUA benefits, and we need to have their W-2 wages uploaded. So then next, um, this is the, um, the screen where it gives you instructions on where to look, for instance, if you're filing a certain IRS schedule or if you're um, filing for your w, uploading your W-2. So we, Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, and so we had heard that people could potentially be confused about exactly what information they should include in there. So, Kim, I know you worked really hard to make sure that the schedules were listed and the lines of yes. that they should be looking at. So, for <clears throat> determining your PUA weekly benefit amount, uh, the U USDOL guidance has said that we need to use net income. So, for instance, Schedule C, we're referencing line 31, that is the, the net income from that schedule. That is the amount that would need to be entered in the 2019 earnings box. And then once you enter that, click on Next. And this is where you would actually upload your documentation. Click on the Browse button, it will let you go through your computer and, and identify which files you want to upload. We are asking that all the documentation be put into one file and attached here. And so I know last week we had talked about the difference between net and gross and the recent guidance we had received from USDOL um, and we received some questions about how are people supposed to know that. So as we noted on that previous screen, it is net income for this purpose. Um, we also talked a little bit last week about that guidance that we received from USDOL that shifted um, what needs to be reported on the weekly certification. So individuals going forward who are self-employed would need to report their gross wages on their weekly certification, not the net, not net um, income for that week. And we will be sending out a, an actual letter to individuals who have identified themselves as being self-employed. We'll also send that out via email explaining what the change is and when that goes into effect. And that will be uh, prospective. We will not be doing that retroactively. So once they are notified, they will need to provide their gross income on the weekly certification. But again, for this purpose, for uploading documentation, it is net income. Oh, okay. This is uh, Senator Bellows. Just two questions on that. Is that portal for uploading available? So if people recognize that they're not in, they're in one of the 8,000 because their benefits haven't been recalculated. Um, do they have that ability to do that at this time? Um, and then my other question is, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I think no, that option is not yet available. We will be making that option available once we send out the notifications. And if I could just add to that, if you happen to be one of those individuals who we matched your income already, if you clicked on that link, you will you'll get a message that says we have already matched your, your income and there's nothing to submit. And your second question, Senator? Oh, just is it possible for us to adjust the definition of gross income in state law? I saw the federal guidance and it just seems really cruel to calculate your overall base benefit based on net income, but your weekly benefit based on gross. Um, I know we've received a lot of concerned questions from especially people who are self-employed. And Senator, because this is a federal um, program, I, I don't know that uh, making changes to state law would um, would be permissible, but that would be the kind of question we would have to reach out to our federal partners and see if there was a way to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. So this slide shows uh, 
some of the program changes that are happening um, in the next uh, already happened or happening in the next couple of weeks. We've talked about the FPUC, the extra $600 is expiring. We talked about the income verification, but we also wanted to remind folks that work search requirements for some individuals will be starting again starting on August 9th. These um, are for individuals who have been permanently laid off from their previous employer and not expecting to go back to work for that same employer. Uh, starting on August 9th, they will need to begin looking for work. And our main career center staff are prepared to help people um, do that. Uh, alongside the, the requirement for looking for work, there will be a requirement to have an account in the job link, which will um, match uh, skills with uh, available openings in your area. Uh, so feel free to you know, visit maincareercenter.gov to look at the services available. Many of the services available through the Career Center are available virtually. And um, we thought it might be good uh, to just kind of, again, remind people about the different programs and almost the flow of how, um, although each program may have slightly different criteria, they're all uh, contained within unemployment insurance. So state <clears throat> unemployment benefits, uh, these, these are available to anyone who has met those monetary eligibility requirements typically have been laid off through no fault of their own, is able to work, available to work, actively seeking work. Um, the main legislature, all of you, took uh, important action uh, back in March that said that under the emergency provisions, there are certain uh, flexibilities that are allowed, and those emergency provisions are in place um, from uh, the beginning of this March 13th through August 8th. Um, unless uh, they are extended. And the coverage under state unemployment is up to 26 weeks. The pandemic unemployment compensation program um, <clears throat> is, is anyone who meets unemployment insurance eligibility but has exhausted their regular state unemployment benefits. And this program is available um, from April 4th through December 26th of 2020. And what this does is it adds an additional up to, again, 13 weeks after someone has exhausted their state unemployment insurance benefits. Then there is an extended state benefit program. And in order to be eligible for this, you have to, again, meet the regular unemployment insurance eligibility requirements. But these are for folks who have fully exhausted state unemployment insurance, the pandemic unemployment compensation benefits, and then could get rolled into this additional state extended benefit program for up to 13 weeks. <clears throat> and then the next column is the pandemic unemployment assistance program. And this is for people who are not eligible for regular state unemployment insurance, um, extended benefit or pandemic emergency compensation. So, and this group of people are typically the gig workers, self-employed, um, or others who have exhausted other programs. And this program is available from April 4th through December 26th, and 2020. And you're eligible for up to 39 weeks. So this really, um, uh, mirrors what you would have been eligible for if you were eligible for state unemployment and state extended benefits. That 30, 39 weeks, I think I said 36, 39 weeks uh, of the 26 plus the 13. Um, so if you are only eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance, you would still be eligible for that 39 weeks of uh, benefits that in some of the other programs have to be packaged. And we kind of um, shaded out the final column, which is the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation. Uh, for that program, you had to have been receiving at least $1 in any of the unemployment insurance programs in order to draw down that Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program. And most people were um, eligible for that. Uh, and again, we're monitoring carefully what um, is happening 
uh, in Congress and we will um, make whatever adjustments are necessary to that program if and when Congress does act. So, um, you know, even though the, the volume of initial claims has gone down uh, dramatically since the early days of the pandemic, we are still seeing very, very high levels of um, unemployment uh, claims, uh, weekly claims primarily being filed at this point, as well as um, still a few thousand initial claims in both pandemic and regular unemployment programs. Um, we have had roughly 154,000 people apply for unemployment benefits since March. Of that group, about 96% of them have received a determination uh, uh, and have, are either receiving a benefit payment, about 86%, um, or have been um, completed the appropriate initial claim but have not filed for weekly certification, which is about 7%, or we're just about 2% were determined to not be eligible. Um, and uh, since March, about 133,400 people have received at least one benefit payment. And this is up uh, about 2,400 from people from last week. So every week we continue to process um, thousands of claims. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, when you look at that remaining, you know, we talked about the 96% of the remaining 4% of claimants that we still need to respond to. We have um, engaged in a series of different activities, um, in basically doing outreach to people who may have applied for regular unemployment insurance, but um, have not applied for pandemic unemployment assistance. And we're sending, we sent letters to them to just ask them to fill out those forms to determine not, I keep saying filling out forms, asking them to go into their weekly certification and complete the application to determine if they are eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance or not. We wanted to give people um, an additional opportunity to do that. So that's one of the things that we're working on. Um, we are, uh, we've changed our uh, fact-finding process to expedite it, and we are continuing uh, to refine our um, our work on fraud. Uh, it is um, not just here in Maine, but across the country, identifying and preventing fraudulent payments from going out uh, has been um, one of the um, more uh, challenging um, aspects of delivering this program that we uh, have encountered, uh, that the OIG has talked about, I think he was saying something like $26 billion in, um, in fraudulent payments. Um, are the, the possibility uh, is out there of billions of dollars. And so we are trying to make sure that the only people who receive benefits are people who are actually eligible. Um, and we're trying to do that as quickly as, as possible. I think we want to dig into the numbers a little bit more uh, that I had started laying out. Kim, do you want to? Sure. As you can see from the graphs on the page, uh, overall, the number of individuals who have filed for unemployment has increased from just over 148,000 at the end of June to 154,000 um, this week. Of the 154,600, actually, 133,400, as the commissioner said earlier, have received payments. Um, in the, the middle section, the 11,200 in the red section, as you can see, that's come down a little bit uh, since the first of the month. We have been sending emails to individuals who filed an initial claim but hadn't filed any of their weekly certifications. Then we are seeing some um, people filing their claim because of that. I, I want to add that there are probably a, a number of those people who legitimately are not no longer filing a weekly certification. Uh, they may have filed that initial claim, but then either continued to be paid by their employer or are working, and therefore um, no weekly certifications have been filed. 
the next section down in the orange is 3,600 people, roughly, that are currently ineligible. This is because they either had um, excess earnings in a week for which they were filing for the benefits, or there was some other eligibility issue. In the dark blue section, the next one down, the 2,600 uh, we currently have flagged as potentially fraudulent. That number has held pretty consistent over the, uh, the month. And then the bottom category, which is probably the one that you're most interested in, the 3,800 people, roughly, who are in process at the moment. If we skip to the next slide, um, we want to break down that 3,800 group for you. As you can see in the pie chart on the right-hand side, uh, approximately 2,300 of them, 61% of that uh, small group are waiting for fact-finding. As the commissioner mentioned earlier, we are expediting fact-finding. Um, we have a team set aside to go through and work on those fact-findings from the oldest to the newest. And I, I think uh, the other thing that's important uh, to note here uh, are um, that 911, those are folks that we have reached out to, to mm -hmm. and are waiting for people to complete their um, the PUA application to determine if they are, in fact, eligible for PUA. Uh, the employer verification form, we have about 250 people in there. Um, one of the things that we did um, early on was we had lifted the normal 10 to 14-day processing time. Uh, once we started um, experiencing kind of large, widespread fraud, um, we put back in place that 10 to 14-day normal processing time. And so that 250 number will fluctuate in and out, but that is um, within that 10 to 14-day time frame for the most part. And since the, the 2,300 in the dark blue, so the folks that are waiting for fact-finding is the largest group, we also broke that down into a little more detail for you. Um, which, as you can see on this slide, we have 11 people um, who, who filed in March that are still waiting for their fact-finding. Um, we are working actively working on those, as well as the 18 people that are waiting from April. Um, they are unique cases, and we are trying to pull together enough information so that we can issue the determination there. Okay, there's 165 people who have been waiting since May, and then as you're getting into June and July, as you can see, that is the bulk of the, the fact findings that are currently in the queue. And one of the things about the earlier um, claims as well, not only are they uh, the more challenging, but some of those um, folks may have uh, filed a claim in Let's say uh, May, but their start, their their um, separation date was for March. So that's it. That's the date that we're using is the date of the separation, not necessarily when the person actually filed the claim. <clears throat> so as I had said at the beginning, you, you know the. Uh, the challenges facing the unemployment insurance system are significant. Um, back in January, we had started meeting with the National Employment Law Project to identify what some of the, um, the changes that uh, could be made, um, and we are um, beginning to re-engage in that process again, not, not with the National Employment Law Project, but just based on our recent experiences and identifying process improvement opportunities. And this is just a preliminary um, example of what we're looking at as we're looking at claim submission. Uh, we've heard loud and clear that people do not understand information that's, um, that to us seems very clear, but because it's using uh, UI jargon um, that people don't understand it um, and uh, will require um, uh, different ways of explaining the process to people. Um, we also have heard that uh, people do not understand the specificity of um, documents that we're going to need. For example, um, I may remember that I started working uh, at a particular job in December of 2019 
but I may not know what date I actually started on. And that's the kind, that's the level of detail that's required in order to accurately complete um, unemployment insurance applications and it, because you are trying to match um, data. Um, also, there is a, um, a desire and a heavy reliance on um, phone calls in order to, um, to complete some of the uh, routine tasks, and the uh, application process is not mobile friendly, um, and it was not designed for that. That was one of the uh, enhancements that uh, we were planning to implement and um, beginning conversations about before the pandemic hit. And we've, um, again, the pandemic has pointed out that, that that's the kind of, um, of uh, accessibility since most people, or not most people, but well, it might be most people, many people are relying on their mobile phones as their primary uh, electronic device. So the, under claim submission, those are the kinds of issues that we've been hearing around the processing and approval of claims. Uh, there, uh, and we frequently receive questions about what is my status, what does this mean? Um, uh, you know, they don't, un people don't understand um, what they're seeing, even if they are uh, opening up their re-employee accounts and looking in in the screens that they can see. Um, so things like, you know, the 999 date and uh, requiring additional explanation and information. Um, and then uh, around weekly certifications and payments, I, I think it has been um, dealing, so many people having to deal with unemployment insurance for the first time and not understanding um, the process at, at all. And the fact that filing an initial claim does not automatically trigger a payment and the important role of weekly certifications and the need to file that every single week in order to have payments continue has been um, uh, an ongoing education process and we need to think about how to um, provide that kind of education in a, in a uh, more thorough, upfront way. Um, it is a requirement uh, for the unemployment insurance program. Um, as I said earlier, unemployment insurance is a federal state partnership and our federal partners are very clear that you must have a weekly certification in order to um, I, I think some states have been able to do a bi-weekly certification, but you must have an ongoing certification of at least every other week in order to, um, for people to access benefits. <clears throat> and that's to assess ongoing eligibility right. as people's situation changes. And then um, as we're uh, continuing to have more and more uh, people going through the, the unemployment insurance um, process, we also thought it might be useful to just kind of walk through, um, you know, what happens from filing an initial claim and, you know, where are the different um, points where people can file appeals or it, it's uh, one of the things that we've heard over and over again is that people think that you file an initial claim and then it's done. And unemployment insurance, as Kim had said, is every week it's a redetermination of your eligibility um, because you're constantly having to uh, reaffirm that you are still meeting all of those eligibility requirements. It is also a system that is not only a federal state partnership, but it's also, I'm shifting, not talking about pandemic unemployment um, assistance, but just regular unemployment insurance. It's also a, um, an employer-employee um, relationship as well. So Kim, could you just kind of walk through the, the chart here? Sure. So up in the upper left, starting with the first step is to file the initial claim. Then when an, an initial claim is filed, that triggers a two-step eligibility 
process. Up there is the dual eligibility requirement. The first part of that is the monetary eligibility determination. To be eligible for state unemployment, an individual has to be connected to the workforce somehow, and we've defined that as an individual who's earned, you know, roughly $1,700 in at least two quarters in, in the previous 18 months, and then I want to say it's at least 5,600 overall in, in the four consecutive quarters. But that's the monetary eligibility. Have you earned enough to show that you're connected to the workforce? The second phase of that is the uh, eligibility determination about the reason for the separation, the reason someone has become unemployed, or any other eligibility issues um, that may come up, such as you know, remuneration, which is somebody received a, a, a separation payout when they, when they left their employer. So either one of those eligibility determinations can be appealed to the Division of Administrative Hearings. Um, monetary eligibility determinations are appealable only by the individual, whereas a separation determination can be appealed by either the individual or the employer. I'm going to skip down. I'm going to go down into the, the filing, the weekly certification. So after that initial claim, the, the next Sunday after that initial claim is filed, the individual is eligible to start filing weekly certification. And that's where we ask questions about, you know, did you look for work? Are you able and available? Did you earn any income? Um, all of those kind of questions that are asked on a weekly basis. And then um, if something changes in someone's status um, in their unemployment, we may detect an issue which would trigger a fact finding. Um, at the end of the fact finding, the department will issue a determination to either allow, disallow benefits either for the one week for an ongoing or to allow benefits to continue. It depends on what the situation is. And that determination is appealable to the Division of Administrative Hearings, typically by the claimant. Usually weekly issues are um, claimant only, but there can be some such as a refusal of work that would have an employer involved as well. So after the Division of Administrative Hearings issues their decision, which can affirm or um, overturn the original decision, if either party disagree, then you can file an appeal to the Unemployment Insurance Commission, which is a separate body from the department. They are, are not part of the Department of Labor. Um, they will review the case uh, and make a determination as well. Um, and in the instance that either party still disagree with that Unemployment Insurance Commission decision, it is appealable to the Superior Court. So I just thought it was important to put that um, information out there because as people are working their way through the process, I know many of you are hearing uh, questions about fact finding and we're starting to hear people um, asking questions about the uh, Division of Administrative Hearings and what that process is like. Those, they, those are separate. Um, they're not the same people um, and it is a, uh, an administrative law process that um, that starts taking place at that point. So I think that was just a top line overview. We did not receive many questions this week, but it looks like there are a number in the the chat box that we were not able to see because we saw the slides. So maybe go up to the to the beginning. A uh, question about will we be contacting claimants and letting them uh, about POA and let them know? Yes, I think that the deputy commissioner mentioned that that is is happening. And how did that change come about? It was a U.S. Department of Labor. Um, as I had said before, it's a federal state partnership. Pandemic unemployment assistance is a federal program. They issue um, guidance and regulations, and they just issued their most recent guidance on this last Yeah, it was early Tuesday. last week. Yeah. Um, so uh, they can continue to issue guidance at any point until the program ends. Um, so a constituent's, constituent's benefit payments have been on hold for five weeks. She just received a notice to provide identification, I assume due to fraud which she submitted via the website this past Tuesday. What's the time frame for that hold to be lifted? So typically a fraud hold is lifted within a few days. Um, we are pretty, pretty much up to uh, mm -hmm. date on fraud, some, or I would say identify identity verification documentation. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then it's an overnight process. So I would say a few days. 
Are retroactive redetermination benefits being paid as a lump sum? Yes, they are. And I would just add any retroactive benefits that are within the, the FPUC program timeframe um, would also receive the additional $600. Yes, except for the pandemic unemployment assistance folks, I would they probably would have received those. Right, so yeah. if, if we've returned, redetermined someone's PUA yeah. weekly benefit eligibility, that would be paid as a lump sum, um, but as the commissioner said, they would have received their extra $600 when they originally filed, so that would not be included. Right. How can do else thing glitch that is preventing claimants from receiving back payments? Um, really, uh, it's a, almost a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there are there are some that are in groups, but groups are, are much smaller groups. So um, we could have 50 people in one group, or we could have two people in one group that have a common issue that has prevented back payments from happening. But we are working through those again from oldest to newest. Why are 330 claimants pending? People in pending status uh, are those folks who, when they filed their initial claim, we were unable to verify their social security number, or there was a, a name mismatch, or there were wage issues. For instance, or they reported that they worked for an employer, but we don't have wages for them. So they are in a pending status until we can resolve that issue. Will slides be made available? Yes. We are still hearing of people who are getting baseline unemployment, but not the additional $600. Why would that be, and when will it be rectified? Um, See, if you have names of those yeah. people, can you get those to us? So, Commissioner, uh, this is Rebecca. Um, so, Hello. first, um, hi. <laughs> Um, my first, I just wanted to give my personal thanks to Evie for her trying to help me uh, understand this unbelievably complicated world, and I'm I'm afraid to say that I'm still really struggling. So, um, could you help me understand the issue? So, for folks that are partially employed, they're earning some amount of income um, on both sides: one as an employee, and two as a self-employed person. Um, and so uh, there are folks that are earning like, let's say, $500, but their normal income on a weekly basis is um, $1,000. So they've taken a $500 hit because of the pandemic. Would those people qualify um, for uh, the regular uninsurance for the employee and the PUA for um, the uh, self-employed? Um, Senator, probably not. Um, if we would be looking at both of the wages, and the first part that you said was some sort of W-2 wages and that they were earning, uh, working part-time and earning about $500. If you earn more than $5, more than the maximum weekly benefit, and right now the maximum weekly benefit on unemployment is $462 since June 1st. Right, and it, it depends on when you filed your initial claim. Right. So most people are getting the maximum of $455. Right, um, uh, $445. $445, right. Um, so if you filed before June 1st, the maximum benefit was $445 every June. There's a reassessment, and in June it went up to 462. So that's the first thing. When did you file? Then you are allowed to earn um, something uh, like five dollars more than that. So let's say even you were at the 462 and the five dollars that gets you to 467. If you are earning more than 467 a week. You would, actually 467 or more. Or more, yeah. You would not be eligible for any unemployment benefit you, because you would be determined to um, have excessive earnings. 
So you might meet all the other qualifications, but, but you would have excessive earnings and not be entitled to a benefit that week. There's a short, um, I don't know if somebody can post it, but there's a short um, video that explains partial uh, benefits, and it is incredibly complicated, but that's kind of the bottom line. It's not a, um, a replacement of wages that you lost. It, it is a maximum benefit that you're going to be eligible for. Okay, so just so you know, Evie, that's how I understood it. And then I talked to somebody and I got all confused. So I'm back on track. Thank you very much. Um, and if I may just jump in with one other question um, around the teachers. Again, thank you, Evie, yeah. for um, bringing me up to speed a little bit. I, I understand um, that teachers and or uh, um, hourly employees can qualify for assistance if they've lost summer employment due to the pandemic. But what I'm hearing is that some folks have been put into fact finding and some haven't. Um, can you help me understand how that's happening? I think one of the things, first of all, we did meet with the um, Maine Education Association earlier this week to kind of walk through with MEA um, some of these issues as well, um, because I, I think it is incredibly confusing, and we do want to make sure that we're all providing the same information. Um, <clears throat> un uh, unemployment insurance is not only kind of complicated, it's also dependent on individual circumstances and the information that's provided on the forms. So you could have, you know, two of us doing what looks like the same work, but Kim's, uh, Kim may have like a different part-time job than I have, or she may have reported it differently than I did on the, on the forms. And I think there may be some of that that's happening um, as, as well. Um, so I can't answer exactly why different people are having different experiences, but we try our best to make sure that the, um, that the uh, regulations are applied the same um, across the, the board. Um, but I, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Kim. And that people always have an appeal process. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that was what the purpose of the last slide is, is you go to fact finding. If you don't, want, if you disagree with the outcome in the fact finding, then you appeal it to the Division of Administrative Hearings. And then if you disagree with how they determined it, then it goes to the Unemployment Insurance Commission. And that um, ability to appeal the decisions and due process is built into this program is something that's really important. And then what we would do for training purposes <laughs> is if we see a number of cases that went to fact finding, that then the Division of Administrative Hearings overturned those decisions, that would be used to be tr to train our adjudicators at the lower level. And what I would add to that is that um, we hear from a lot of people who are at the end of their appeal period or unfortunately after their appeal period, sending letters or making a phone call about why they disagree with the decision. Um, each of those decisions, be it the monetary eligibility determination or the separation or other eligibility determination, they all have a description of how to file an appeal. The easiest way to do it is in the reemployee account um, right there, but make sure you, you follow that process to preserve your right to appeal the decision. Um, how long is, on average, is fact find? How long does it take for somebody to get actually found by a fact finder? I think um, Senator, it was taking a, a while for fact finding to happen early on. Um, as as hopefully the slides demonstrate, we're moving through that process much more quickly now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we've said in, in past weeks, we are, are calling claimants or we're calling the employers when we have questions about it and asking if, if they want to waive their, their right, because they do have a right to a five-day notice before we do that fact-finding. And it is absolutely okay if they are not prepared and they, they want to wait, that's okay. Um, but trying to get ahead of those, we are asking people 
if they mm -hmm. are if they want to waive that five day notice. Great. And I think this to one of the next questions uh, if that they've heard from frustrated constituents who've missed calls from MDOL. And so what are they supposed to do about that? I think that if this is in relation to a fact finding, what um, people are doing is um, calling and then giving a, a date five days uh, later um, where they can um, expect um, to receive the, the phone call. Um, we are um, basically any of our adjudicators who have any free time, or free time is a, is a, is a loaded term because no one has any free time. As soon as people finish one task, they're moving on to the next task. So they are calling people who may not be scheduled for a fact finding until weeks down the road. Um, and uh, that is how um, we are trying to expedite the processing of this. So I see we have a question on the work search form drafts. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we showed you mock-ups of what we were going to be using for the work search forms. Um, got feedback from you. We've heard from others as well that uh, it could be clearer and it could be easier for people to follow. So we have modified those. We didn't bring copies of those screenshots today. But there really there will be a new question um, in place that asks if you're self-employed or if you're expecting to return to your previous employer. If you answer yes, if either one of those situations apply to you, then you would not be asked the work search question. I think we have hit on all of the questions that were in the chat. If there are any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or add them to the chat. So thank you. Thank you for everyone who joined us this afternoon on, a, on what is a beautiful Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm.